Well, uh, first I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and congratulate you on the facility, the nice facility you have and the work you're doing. My name is Hussein Hamda and I'm currently at the Department of Physics at Michigan State University. Uh, the presentation will be about most for spectroscopy and I will also present a few applications. So the first thing I will talk about is the, the most power effect, talk about the experiment, and the hyperfine parameters we measure, and then how we can use these parameters um, to uh, characterize material, if it's ma magnetic properties, if, uh, if it's structural properties, or if it's uh, uh, their electric uh, uh, properties. The first example will be about conductivity in magnetite. Uh, the second is I'll be looking at the core shell uh, effects in uh, nanoparticles of germanium uh, or silicon iron oxide. And then we'll show you some examples about superparamagnetism in magnesium ferrite particles. And perhaps if we have enough time, I listed too many examples up here, uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, cation distribution, how we can measure them directly by MOSFOR Now, uh, before I go to the MOSFOR effect, I listed, uh, put there the electronic levels of iron atom energy levels of the uh, nucleus of iron. Though I am going to restrict my talk to iron 57, uh, you have a few isotopes that uh, can be used uh, in most mass spectroscopy, but my talk will be strictly about the uh, iron. Now the most power effect is simply the recoilless emission of gamma ray uh, by a nucleus and the subsequent absorption, its subsequent absorption by an identical uh, nucleus. It's depicted in this uh, schematic up here. We have the nucleus at the excited state, drops to the ground state. The emitted photon must depart with the energy difference in order to excite an identical, an identical nucleus. And so that's simply the most boring effect. Now, to uh, let me start with the three nucleus. Now, uh, if you have a free nucleus and you have the energy scale, and let's say this is the uh, E gamma, and the immediate gamma is is to the <coughs> left, this is, uh, let's say the energy up here, E zero, is the difference between the two levels. And for a free nucleus, of course, you have recoil energy, so the photon will depart with the energy that is less than uh, that uh, the difference between the excited state and the ground state. And also to have uh, to have it absorbed by the identical nucleus, this photon has to compensate for the recoil energy also of the absorbing nucleus. And you could see that uh, the, the uh, exciting gamma, uh, gamma ray has an energy which is, uh, what does not match that of the absorption, because the difference between them here is two er, and so there will be there is no way to match the exciting state with the excited state. And now, uh, one way to do that is to compensate for it, and to use uh, thermal energy to heat the, 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 the system. And we know that thermal energy will produce warning to the energy profile, and then you will have some overlap, and you could have resonant absorption when they overlap on it. But this is uh, the best way to do it, is to eliminate the recoil energy. And to give an example of elimination of recoil energy, give this example, given in Kansas, perhaps it's not as good here because they do a lot of hunting there. Uh, we know the small gun, if you have the same bullet, the small gun will recoil more than uh, the large gun because the recoil energy is inversely proportional to the mass. Now, if you have the three nucleus and you, you put that nucleus in a lattice, then you expect the recoil energy to uh, 
go to the whole lattice, to the mass of the whole lattice. And if now you substitute the mass of the nucleus with the mass of the material where this nucleus is embedded, you expect the required energy to go to zero. And if you take a prime particle, probably it has 10 times of the power 23 nuclei in it. So you expect the required energy uh, to go uh, to zero. However, this is not the whole story because you know we have the phonon <coughs> system. And this is uh, the Einstein model. If we know that the phonon system uh, have you know the quantum states have h bar omega and three halves h bar omega and so on. And then the recoil energy could go to these states, excite from one state to another. And for this reason we will have what we call recoil free fraction. So there is a possibility for the recoil energy to go to the phonon system. Okay? And that possibility if, if it goes to it you take subtract it from one and you will have the fraction of recoil free emission. Okay? And if you have a nucleus, identi identical nucleus, also it will have a you know some recoil free resonant absorption. That's why we call it resonant absorption because uh, you have no recoil energy, and I, I just put the, the recoil free fraction will be equal uh, uh, to this function where uh, k is given by 2 y over lambda, and x square is the mean displacement of, uh, of, of the atom. So now we have possibilities or probabilities that we could have recoil free fraction, and actually for iron, uh, it, it's too high, uh, probably it's more than 60 percent. When you cool down, also it goes even higher than that. Uh, this is the; these are the basic components of a most of uh, experiment. You have the velocity transducer. It, it Doppler shift the energy. You have the source clamped to it, and it moves back and forth, and just to modulate the energy. Okay, and, uh, and if you for, for iron, for example, you need this to go with a maximum velocity of 10 millimeter per second. And it, it's enough to. Uh, modulate the energies in, in, in microns of electron volts, which is good enough for the nuclear energy levels. And uh, then you have the, your absorber up here, and then you could have your counter of the gamma rays behind, or you could build a counter around, uh, around the specimen. Okay, now if you, uh, you, you build a counter around, around the specimen, we know when the gamma rays go through, I mean the electrons resonant absorption or non-resonant absorption. The electrons are emitted. But when you have resonant absorption and the gamma ray is absorbed by the nucleus, then it will be re-emitted. And most of the time it goes and convert the core electrons. So you have what we call internal conversion. It will not escape as gamma rays, but it goes and knock off electrons. Okay, And then you will have on the top of non-resonant electrons coming out of the material, you have the electrons that knocked out by resonance. So you, you have a large number of electrons coming out when you have resonant absorption. And then if you count the electrons, then you see the number of counts at resonance goes up. And you will collect this factor where the peaks are pointing upward. This mode is good if you're studying thin films or very thick films, for example, where the gamma rays cannot escape out. You know, like to study a bridge, for example. Probably not a bridge, you can build the detector around the piece you want to see, and you can see, start to see iron oxides there. Now, if the specimen of, of the right thickness, you could put this is the best way we call the geometric mode, you put the counter there, and whenever you have resonant absorption, then and you're counting gamma rays now, gamma photons, then the number of counts goes down at resonance, and so you have the peaks. And these are the basic components of uh, uh, the most of spectrometry. Now this is uh, what the transducer does. Let's say this is uh, energy uh, of the excited the state that you're trying to excite. And at this velocity, this is the velocity, at this velocity, uh, you're moving this, see how you move it, 
uh, you're moving this in this way, you're moving that way. So th this is you have no match between the energy of the photon and the state that you're trying to excite. As you move in, when you have maximum match, then the number of counts, of course, goes down because you have resonant absorption. You're, you're matching the excitement, the state you're trying to excite with the energy of the photon. Now, if you go further, then the, pro, you know, the overlap will be less, and then the number of counts will, will be less. And so, experimentally, you will have this line, this resonant line, which, of course, it, ha it will have the width, uh, which is twice the natural width of the photon. All of us know that the photon has a profile, and uh, its width is, is the natural width. So the most power line, if you exclude all other effects, it should have twice the natural line of the photon. Okay, and definitely when you have maximum overlap, you will have uh, maximum resonant absorption, and the number of counts will be less. And so that's what we observe, and this is will be a function of velocity because new transducer is Doppler shifting the energy and modulating the energy uh, and changing its value by amount which is good enough to match uh, the excited state you, you're trying to measure. Now, uh, uh, by most power effect, actually, we measure the nuclear energy level, like, like, like I said. But we are not interested in the nucleus. We are interested in the uh, electron system. And so by measuring the, these uh, nuclear energy levels, which is the interaction, the hyperfine interaction between the electron system and the nuclear system, and you know the, what is your nuclear system, so you learn about your electron system. And without going into the details of interaction, the electrostatic interaction between the charges, the electron charges around the nucleus and the charge distribution of the nucleus and the magnetic moment of the nucleus with the magnetic field produced around. We have three important uh, interactions, and I mentioned them. One is called the Ismore shift, and the other is called the quadrupole splitting, and the third is called the hyperfine magnetic field. And I'll simply uh, just go over them. The Ismore shift it, it measures the valency. Actually, it's, it's the interaction of, of the charge uh, of the nucleus with the S-like electrons of the nucleus. Okay, and that will give you information <coughs> about the valency of, of the atom, and the electron, the electron structure of the atom. The other one is the quadrupole splitting, uh, which is the interaction of the electric field gradient with the quadrupole moment of, of the nucleus. And also that will give you information about the charge of the atom and the symmetry, more, more important the symmetry, because we know if we have cubic symmetry, then uh, 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 the uh, electric field degrade is equal to zero, and you will not have the quadrupole splitting. So if you have lower symmetry, then you expect the electric, the quadrupole interaction to be uh, large. And then the uh, last one, and most important, is the hyperfine magnetic field, which is the interaction of the magnetic field produced by the electronic system, and mainly the S electrons. But the S electrons, of course, are influenced by the dipole moment of the atom itself. And uh, the, the, the uh, whole thing is influenced by the magnetic order in the material, because if the dipole moment is, is paramagnetic, then the nucleus will see zero uh, hyperfine magnetic field. So after the ma material order, the nucleus will not see hyperfine magnetic, magnetic field. And uh, the hyperfine magnetic field actually is proportional to the magnetic moment of the atom. And so these are the three interactions. And uh, for iron, what is good about iron, that all of these interactions, like I said, depends on the valence electrons, the 3D and the 4S electrons. And these electrons reside at the outermost shell of the atom and they are easily influenced by the surrounding. So influenced by whatever atoms you, they bond to and the environment they are in. And so you could, it's sensitive uh, to the surrounding and you could pick up a lot of information. Sometimes more information that you can, you can decipher what you need. Uh, and uh, so let me start with the isomorph shift. Let's say if you have one line, 
that means you have more quadrupole interaction and you have no uh, uh, magnetic interaction. Okay, the isomer shift will will manifest itself as the shift of the centroid of the spectrum from zero. In this case, since you have one peak, it's the shift of this peak from zero velocity. So that's how you find the isomer shift. Now, if you have a quadrupole interaction, like this is the state of the nucleus, of course, you excite from half to three halves. And if you have isomorphic shift, it's, it's nothing but a shift. You shift the ground state and you shift, shift the excited state and you end with a total shift. But if you have a quadrupole interaction, it doesn't lift the degeneracy of the ground state, but it partially lifts the degeneracy of the excited state. And so you would have a possibility of two transitions from the ground state to the plus or minus half or to the plus or minus three halves. And if you match these, I mean, you have the proper energy by the Doppler shift, then you'll have uh, two resonant absorption. You'll have two lines. And uh, the difference between the two lines is simply the quadrupole splitting. So you find the position of these two lines at certain velocities, you subtract them, and that's the quadrupole splitting in millimeter per second. Now also you could notice that uh, this, this spectrum <coughs> is not centered around zero because there's an isomorph shift. So you take the centroid, the middle distance between the two peaks, and you see how much it's shifted from zero velocity, and that's the isomorph shift. And remember, you only have two lines or two peaks, and that's what we call it the double. Now, if you have a magnetic interaction, the isomorph shift is there all the time, and possibly sometimes you have the combined uh, the quadrupole interaction and the magnetic interaction, but let's talk about the magnetic interaction around. Of course, the Zeeman effect, you lift the degeneracy of the ground state into plus or minus half, and the excited state into plus three halves all the way to minus three halves. And now you have the possibility of six transitions. Uh, you could have eight, but the other one is prohibited by the selection rule. So you only have uh, six possible transitions, and then you will have six absorption lines due to that. And the overall width will give you the strength of the upper fine magnetic field of the nucleus. So the distance between the first, actually we call it first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth lines numerated like this. You start from the negative velocity all the way uh, to the maximum velocity. You have six lines when you have magnetic ordering and the overall width of the spectrum, that is the difference between the six and the first peak uh, is a measure of the upper fine magnetic field. Now if you do a combined, I will just show you what will happen. Um, that minus 3 and plus 3 will be shifted upward due to the quadrupole uh, splitting or shift. The minus 7 and 3 halves will be gone down. And then the spacing between the lines will be different. And also you could find the quadrupole splitting uh, from this, from the position of the lines. Okay. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult. This is for a simple case where we are, we, I am assuming that the electric field, the principal axis of the electric field gradient and the direction of the magnetic field to be along the z-axis but sometimes they are not. And if there is an angle between them, it's very difficult. And here we are assuming that the quadrupole interaction is small. We consider it as perturbation. Uh, so uh, usually when we, when we have magnetic uh, ordering, uh, what I will call the quadrupole splitting I measure, I will call it the apparent one because it's not the real one. Okay, if I have to find the real one, I have to know the direction between the electric field gradient principal axis and the direction of the magnetic field. <coughs> and now, uh, let me list some of the disciplines that use most power spectroscopy. Uh, you have the measured values, the isomorph shift, like I said, you have the magnetic hyperfine, and you have the electric quadrupole, and you have the recoil refraction, which we talked about. In nuclear, we, we don't care about nuclear physics now, 
but in solid state physics you learn about the electric structure from the isomorphic shift like I mentioned uh, from the magnetic hyperfine you, you, you learn about the magnetic structure electronic configuration of magnetic ions you learn uh, from uh, the electric quadrupole like I said the electronic configuration the symmetry if it's cubic or less than cubic and from the recoil free fraction of course you learn about the vibration of, of and, and how the atoms are suspended on the lattice. So you learn about the uh, phonon spectrum. Same thing with chemistry, you learn about the valence electrons, the valency electron configuration, uh, legend symmetry, and uh, anisotropic binding. Uh, metallurgy also use it, biology use it, analytical also, well, they use it. And one other thing we learn we learn from uh, most pro spectroscopy is the direction of magnetization. I uh, did not I did mention it before. If you notice the intensity of the two lines, before I go to it, the intensities of the two lines, uh, they are, if you start with this as one, the relative intensity, you will say this is two third and this is one third. Usually you take the area under the peaks. And this is one third, two third, and this is one. And that's when you have uh, the direction of magnetization vis-a-vis uh, -vis the direction of the gamma beam randomly oriented, which is in polycrystalline material, that's the case. The direction of magnetization is randomly oriented uh, compared to the direction of the gamma ray. You shoot the gamma ray in one direction, magnetization. But, and this is independent of the angle, and it is two-third, like I said, this angle, uh, A16, that means it's the relative intensity of the one and six peaks because they are the same. A two and five, so the and A three and four. So the relative ratio of these are one four sine square theta divided by three into one plus cosine square theta zero point three three. And so and theta is the angle between the gamma beam direction and the direction of magnetization. And all the time you know the direction of the gamma beam, and so you learn about the direction of magnetization in the material which is very important also. And so in most pro spectroscopy, not only you get the hyperfine magnetic field, which gives you the magnitude of the magnetic moment, also you get the direction of uh, the magnetic moment of the individual atoms. And that, of course, you cannot get that by magnetization of other techniques. Now to go to the application, all these examples I'm going to list, they have the cubic spinel structure. Oh, I've seen a lot of work up here today about this cubic spinel structure. It's, it's, it's a FCC network of oxygen, and you will have the cation with two environments. One is called the tetrahedron, surrounded by four <coughs> oxygen, and the other is called the octahedron, which is surrounded by six oxygen. And in this cubic spinel, you have one a side, we call the tetrahedral A side, and you have two B sides occupied. So you have three sides for the cations and the uh, oxygen on, uh, on the FCC lattice. And uh, to go further, uh, all, all, uh, a lot of these properties are known. For example, the magnetic coupling. If you have uh, magnetic ions uh, on, these, uh, on these sides, the magnetic coupling between uh, this ions is all the time negative. If it's inter or intra sublattice coupling, they are all negative. But the stronger coupling is between the A and B. So if you have a magnetic ion on the A side and the B side, you will have a stronger exchange uh, interaction. So you have a stronger magnetic uh, interaction. And then you force the, the, the magnetic ions on the B sides, you force them to be up because you cannot have all of them negative. And you force the one on the A side also to be up. Only the AB will be uh, up and down. And then the material actually is fairly magnetic. But if you have all your magnetic ions on the B side, and then uh, they are equivalent side, then, uh, then the material also will be anti-ferromagnetic because the BB coupling also is negative. But if you have, for example, uh, the A side is sparsely occupied by magnetic ions, and then you might have frustration. You know, because uh, you have now uh, uh, competing for forces. If you have vacancies somewhere, and you, 
and uh, the AB side is forcing to be up and down, but you do not have all the A atoms over there, and that could lead to uh, disorder magnetic states. So in many cases, when you have the A side occupies partially by magnetic ions, you will have uh, frustration. Now, uh, let me start with the magnetite. And actually, I will focus on the spectra taken at room temperature. Uh, uh, if you look at, this is non-stichometric magnetite, by the way. And I condensed both uh, this morning. These two peaks, they see it as one peak, and I hope I convinced them that one of them belongs to the B side. And so uh, for uh, stichometric uh, magnetite, you have this peak and that peak. One is ascribed to the A side, and the other is ascribed uh, uh, to the B side. And uh, usually, this is the, the, the formula for this iron 304. And uh, you will have one iron per molecule, uh, one iron 3 plus on the A side, and you will have one iron 3 plus on the A side, and you will have an iron 2 plus on the B side. So you have the same ratios. Uh, of iron 3 on the A side and iron 3 and iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus on the B side. Now what uh, what produces this is the stichometry, is, like I said, the material is, is, is non-stichometric. And people did see it before. However, like I said, uh, probably due to advanced Moscow spectroscopy or to this material is high purity, I w you know, we were able uh, to resolve this extra one. And we've seen it. And that actually the discovery of this one led uh, to, uh, um, to uh, new information, I think I would find new information about the uh, electrical conductivity in, in, this, uh, in this material. Now, uh, if this is ascribed to the B side, and actually people uh, say it's, it's postulated by their way that on the B side, because you have the equivalent side, the electron is hopping between iron 3 and iron 2 plus. And so you have mixed valency, you have male valence of iron 2 plus bond. And that's what the nucleus, uh, and that's what the nucleus say. Now before, let me give you a background before I talk about the conductivity of, of this material. <coughs> the conductivity of, of, of magnetite has maximum value at room temperature. And it behaves like metal at higher temperature, and at lower temperature, it behaves like a, a semiconductor. At 120 Kelvin, there is a second 